Hello and welcome to Indus News. Live from Islamabad, I'm Naila Shuja and these are the headlines. In Afghanistan, security forces and the Taliban have both claimed that they inflicted heavy casualties on the other in attacks of the latest. An Afghan Defense Ministry statement and security forces killed at least 37 Taliban fighters in Kandahar on Sunday. For their part, the Taliban claimed killing several soldiers in Helmand and Ghazni, but they didn't comment on the Defense Ministry statement. The two adversaries are expected to meet in Turkey later this month for U.S.-sponsored peace talks. India has reported a record daily high surge in COVID-19 infections as over 100,000 people tested positive in a day. Pakistan has registered over 4,300 coronavirus cases and 43 deaths overnight, taking the tally over 14,800. Globally, the virus has claimed 2.8 million lives and infected over 131 million people so far. Jordan's estranged Prince Hamza says he will not obey the army's orders restricting his movement. The former Crown Prince said this in an audio message released by the country's opposition. The government has placed Hamza under house arrest and detained 16 others after accusing them of conspiring with foreign elements to destabilize the country. In Bangladesh, 26 people have died and several others are missing as a ferry sank after colliding with a cargo vessel in the Shitalakshya River near Dhaka. Police say the ferry was en route to Munshi Ganj from Niranyang Ganj district carrying some 50 people. Search for survivors continue after the rescue operations were hampered by a storm last night. For more news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. In Afghanistan, security forces and the Taliban have both claimed that they have inflicted heavy casualties on the other in the latest attacks. An Afghan Defense Ministry statement said security forces killed at least 37 Taliban fighters in Kandahar on Sunday. For their part, the Taliban claimed killing several soldiers in Helmand and Ghazni, but they didn't comment on the Defense Ministry statement. The two adversaries are expected to meet in Turkey later this month for U.S.-sponsored peace talks. The U.S. is pushing Kabul and the Taliban to finalize a peace deal at the proposed conference as the May 1st deadline looms for the withdrawal of foreign troops. The deadline is part of a February 2020 agreement the U.S. signed with the Taliban in Doha to end the longest war in U.S. history. India has reported the highest daily cases so far with more than 100,000 infections overnight. Globally, the virus has claimed 2.8 million lives and infected 131 million others. More in this report. As many countries are battered with the third wave of COVID-19, experts have already warned of a fourth one shortly. Top U.S. infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci says getting as many people vaccinated as possible in the shortest period is the only way to avoid another disaster. To ramp up the inoculation drive, the U.S. has put Johnson & Johnson in charge of a plant that ruined 15 million vaccine doses. The country has also stopped the facility from producing the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. Down south, Latin America, however, continues to face grim realities with little reassurance. Just over a week before voters go to the polls to elect a new president, Peru reported a record number of daily deaths. Colombia is set to extend coronavirus restrictions based on intensive care unit occupancy rates. Tenemos claro. It's clear that the epidemiological situation in some municipalities have shown increases in recent weeks, and there also exists the risk of a new national increase in coming weeks. We must act, prevent, and take appropriate decisions. In England, under the new plans, people will be entitled to take a rapid test twice a week 
to prevent outbreaks and find asymptomatic cases. Portugal, meanwhile, has extended restrictions on travel to neighboring Spain until April 15th. In Thailand, tourism dependent Phuket Island has embarked on a mass inoculation program two months before the rest of the country. On July 1st, we will open the town for tourists. If we can build immunity for 70 to 80 percent of the population on the island, we can receive foreign tourists who have been vaccinated without the need for quarantine. Over in Asia, China reported its highest daily surge in over two months as a city in southwestern Yunnan province accounted for all the 15 new local cases. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, the coronavirus has claimed 43 more lives in the past 24 hours. Health officials say more than 4,300 people tested positive overnight. Nationwide, the death toll has risen to 14,821. Pakistan has reported 692,000 confirmed cases since the pandemic began. So far, nearly 616,000 people have recovered from the disease. There are more than 61,000 active cases nationwide and nearly 3,600 patients in critical care. Meanwhile, thousands of Pakistanis have rushed for inoculation after the commercial sale of COVID-19 vaccines began. The officials at vaccination sites in the southern city of Karachi said the vaccines were already sold out. In another development, President Arif Alvi is chairing a virtual meeting regarding the SOPs during Ramadan. Jordan's estranged Prince Hamza says he will not obey the army's soldiers, restricting his movement and communication. The former crown prince said this in an audio message released by the country's opposition. Prince Hamza was put under house arrest after the military warned him over the actions it said were undermining security and stability in Jordan. The government has also detained 16 others after accusing them of conspiring with foreign elements to destabilize the country. Jordan's neighbors and allies have expressed solidarity with King Abdullah bin Al Hussein over the security measures in the kingdom. In Bangladesh, at least 26 people have died while several others are missing after a ferry sank in the Shatalakshya River near the capital, Dhaka. Police said the ship was en route to Munshin Ganj from Narayan Ganj district when it collided with a cargo vessel. Officials say the ferry was carrying around 50 passengers and some of them managed to swim ashore. The passengers were traveling to their hometown after the government announced a new COVID-19 lockdown. Search for survivors continues after the rescue operation were hampered by a storm last night. Meanwhile, more than a dozen people have died after the first tropical storm of the season swept over different regions of the country. The death toll from flash floods and landslides in Indonesia and East Timor has topped 100. The Meteorological Office has warned that more heavy rain is likely to hit the region today. Disaster management officials said 80 people have died while dozens still missing in Indonesia's East Nusa Tenggara province. They added thousands have been displaced after their houses were swept away or buried under the landslides. The disaster mitigation officials said the debris and extreme weather hampered the search and rescue operation. Indonesian President Joko Widodo has offered his condolences and urged people to follow the advice of officials. Meanwhile, the cyclone has claimed 21 lives in neighboring East Timor. Officials said more than 1,500 people have been evacuated to shelters in the capital, Dili. China has warned the United States not to take a superior position and presume it has a final say on global affairs. Foreign Minister Wang Yi says the door for dialogue is open, but it must be based on equality and mutual respect. In an interview, Wang said Beijing will not accept any unilateral demands from Washington. Wang said China will not accept a single nation having a final say on world affairs. He added China will take confrontation calmly without any fear if the U.S. continues on that road. Beijing's top diplomat reiterated China's right to defend its national sovereignty and dignity. In Myanmar, pro-democracy activists are holding more demonstrations today after the killing of six protesters over the weekend. So far, security forces have killed more than 560 people since the February 1st coup. A Malaysian court is hearing former Prime Minister Najib Razak's appeal in, and to annul his conviction in the infamous 1MDB scandal. The appeal proceedings are set to run until the 22nd of April. 
Najib, who is co-founding the 1MDB, was found guilty of laundering $10 million from the state fund. He was sentenced to 12 years in jail and a $50 million fine. The conviction brought down his government in 2018. Najib's lawyers termed his conviction a mistrial and maintained that he did not know about the transactions into his accounts. The European Union has expressed serious worries over Russian troops' movement along the Ukrainian border. The bloc has also pledged its unwavering support for Ukraine's government. EU's foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell voiced the support for Kiev after a phone call with Ukraine's foreign minister Dmitry Kiluba. Borrell also said he will hold further talks on the issue with Kiev's top diplomat and foreign ministers from the EU's 27 nations. The Kremlin did not deny the recent troops' movement, but said that Moscow was not threatening anyone. The military buildup by Russia along the Ukraine border has sparked global concerns over a possible all-out armed conflict. The European Union has termed the departure of all foreign fighters from Libya as a precondition to the country's stability. European Council's President Charles Michel urged the Libyan factions to seize the unique opportunity to build a sovereign and stable country. Michel made the remarks after meeting with Libya's Prime Minister-designate Abdelhamid Dibiba in Tripoli. The Council's President said the European Union actively supports the process of national reconciliation in Libya. He also pledged bloc support for Libya in the areas of economic recovery, elections and the fight against illegal immigration. The foreign ministers of France, Germany and Italy have also visited Tripoli recently in a show of support for Libya's newly formed unity government. Israeli authorities have jailed 230 Palestinian children since the beginning of this year. In a report released on local Children's Day, the Palestinian Prisoner Society said the arrests were concentrated in the occupied city of Jerusalem. The Palestinian Children's Day is celebrated on the 5th of April to raise awareness on the plight of Palestinian children. The rights group that monitors the conditions of detainees in Israeli prisons said the imprisoned children are subjected to various forms of abuse. It said the misconduct includes denying food and drink for long hours, verbal abuse and detainment under harsh conditions. Meanwhile, Defense for Children International said 85 percent of children arrested last year suffered physical violence. Palestine's election board has approved a list of 36 candidates to run in the legislative election scheduled for May. The vote is part of an effort by the Palestinian movements Fatah and Hamas to boost international support for governance. President Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah dominates the Palestinian Authority in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. Meanwhile, Hamas has run the Israeli-blockaded Gaza Strip since 2007. The first parliamentary polls in 15 years will be held on the 31st of July. In Israel, a district court has resumed hearing the corruption cases against Prime Minister Netanyahu. At the opening of the latest hearing, state prosecutors accused Netanyahu of illegitimate use of power and using favors as currency. They said Netanyahu sought improper benefits from owners of major media in Israel for personal gains. Netanyahu, who denies wrongdoing in all three cases, left the courthouse before the first witness was called to testify. This comes as Israel deals with another political deadlock with no party having a clear majority to form the government. The president is meeting parliamentarians in a bid to resolve the impasse. Foreign ministers from Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan have started fresh negotiations over the Nile Dam dispute in Democratic Republic of Congo. The dispute over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam built across the Blue Nile has been simmering for around a decade. Addressing the opening session, African Union Chairman Felix Teshikidi urged all the parties to launch a new dynamic to resolve the dispute. Meanwhile, Egypt's foreign minister also called the meeting the last chance to relaunch talks on the project. Ethiopia has said it will file the dam after seasonal rain starts this summer. However, both Sudan and Egypt insist on the mandatory filling of the reservoir. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us.
welcome back. A once sacred unit within the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center has been closed and the prisoners moved to another facility. In a statement, the U.S. Southern Command says the prisoners at Camp 7 were transferred to a nearby facility. It added that the move is a part of an effort to increase operational efficiency and effectiveness. The Southern Command said the Camp 7 prisoners were moved to Camp 5 safely and without incident. Among those held at Camp 7 were the five prisoners charged with war crimes for their alleged roles in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. President Joe Biden has said he intends to close Guantanamo, but that would require the approval from the Congress. In the United States, tens of thousands of New Yorkers took to the streets to protest against racism and violence targeting Asian Americans across the country. The march along the streets of Manhattan and the Brooklyn Bridge comes as the largest to be staged in New York so far. Organizers say around 500 groups joined the march. The protesters called for an end to hate crimes and racial discrimination, which they say have peaked recently. They also demanded protection of rights of Asians and minorities across the U.S. Apart from Asians, the demonstrators also included groups of other ethnic minorities. Hate for anyone is hate for all, you know, and I just want us all to kind of live together and coexist, and I feel like there should be no negativity between anyone. And I feel the black community and the Asian community, we have our own, you know, beef from before, but we need to put that aside so that we can come together to fight for our lives. Bulgarian Prime Minister Boyko Borisov's center-right GER party is set to win the most seats in Sunday's parliamentary elections. Data from the Central Electoral Commission shows Borisov's party is in the lead, but it may struggle to muster a majority. With two-thirds of ballots counted, Borisov's lead with 25.6 percent votes as the largest party in the next parliament. But he could find it hard to build a coalition after anger over corruption scandals weighed in on his showing. The new anti-establishment party, There Is Such a People, is running second with 18.3 percent votes. It is followed by the opposition socialists with 14.9 percent. The anti-graph center-left coalition of Democratic Bulgaria and stand-up mafia out have mustered up 15.3 percent of the votes. Life will never be the same for people in Mozambique's Palma City following a, the deadly insurgent attacks. Trials and tribunals await the 1,200 survivors who arrived on a boat in Pemba City. But NGOs have cast doubts about the city's capacity to embrace such a large influx of people. More in the support. The terrorist attack on Mozambique's Palma City has displaced tens of thousands more who scattered into the surrounding bush or to the beach to try to catch boats. As the attack survivors swarmed the makeshift camp in a sports hall in the Pama City, aid organization Caritas raised concerns about the rise in crime and exposure of people to COVID-19. The city of Pemba and the infrastructure will not support the number of inhabitants. The city was prepared to accommodate a certain number of people, but now we have a lot of people. For example, now in the market there's lots of people they are exposed to and can be contaminated by COVID-19. Besides the sports hall, people are cramming into schools, hotel rooms and temporary shelters. The aid workers say the rising population is putting pressure on food and water supplies as well as health care and other services. What we do is we are contacting our partners for help in funds so that we can assist the displaced people with food. When the center closes, we have to continue to distribute food to those displaced families every month to reinforce the works of World Food Programme because they alone are not taking control of the situation. The district where Palma is located is adjacent to natural gas projects worth $60 billion. Insurgents' attacks have been increasingly active in the surrounding province of Cabo Delgado since 2017. Environmental degradation is undoubtedly the most threatening global challenge of the coming years. An Indonesian environmental activist has taken up the task to prepare coming generations for this challenge using puppet stories. Details in this report. Wearing a hat shaped as the head of the critically endangered Javen Rhino and carrying a box labeled fairy tales in local language. Some Sudan wizards villages to teach children about environmental degradation using puppet stories. 
His fairy tales are particularly centered on the threat of coastal erosion and how mangrove trees can be used to counter it. The 50-year-old environmentalist has recently brought his puppet show to Indra Mayo, one of the areas in the country most severely affected by land erosion amid loss of mangrove swamps. One of the functions of mangroves is that it can act as a barrier to the strong waves from the ocean when it grows up. So waves will not destroy the land as there can be a lot of damage on land caused by those big waves. Based on the satellite images, nearly 90% of the entire 114-kilometer coastline of Indra Mayo has suffered from erosion. Also, around over 6,000 hectares of land is now flooded by sea water due to an encroaching shoreline. Some Sudin's team of environmentalists are complementing the efforts by planting young saplings in areas which used to be covered by mangrove trees but replanting is an uphill battle. The mangrove planting zone must be located in a coastal tidal area. But the coastal areas in Indra Mayu are rarely exposed to both high or low tides because mostly we get high tides. And as such, it is very difficult to plant because there is no sedimentation. As per the Peatland and Mangrove Restoration Agency, over 600,000 hectares of Indonesia's 3.3 million hectares of mangrove are in critical condition. Meanwhile, the country's forestry ministry's data shows that over 1.8 million hectares of mangroves in Indonesia were damaged. In football, Manchester United have edged closer to a top four finish by beating Brighton and Hove Albion 2-1 in their English Premier Clash. United are in second place with 60 points, 14 behind leaders Manchester City. Marcus Rashford and Mason Greenwood netted one each to secure the win for United. Meanwhile, Aston Villa defeated Fulham 3-1 to ascend to ninth place with 44 points. The loss further dampens Fulham's survival hopes in the league as it remains in the relegation zone. In other fixtures, Southampton edged Burnley 3-2, while Newcastle and Tottenham drew to all. Meanwhile, Sevilla recovered from an early penalty miss to stun La Liga leaders Atletico Madrid 1-0 at home. Sevilla's win has extended a lifeline to title challengers Barcelona and Real Madrid. Despite the loss, Atletico topped the standings with 66 points, three clear of second place Real Madrid. Third place Barcelona will move one point behind Atletico if they beat Real Valladolid on Monday. In the National Basketball Association, the Chicago Bulls have snapped a six-game losing streak by beating the Brooklyn Nets 115 to 107 points at home. The victory has once again breathed life into Chicago's playoffs.